Welcome back, friends. In this chapter, overnight, the world faced a catastrophic shutdown of all water and electricity, with temperatures plummeting by a staggering 100 degrees. While everyone else braved the extreme cold outside, I found solace at home, playing games by the fireplace. As my neighbors stepped out to complain about the dire situation. The entire neighborhood ganged up against me, trying to break through my door because they were jealous of my food supply. If you've missed any previous chapters, the link is in the description below. Be sure to catch up. Alright folks, let's set our sights high today, our goal is 600 likes. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. Joe Ping, along with Fa Yeching and the others, approached my door with kitchen knives and a baseball bat. Joe Ping, hiding the knife behind his back, knocked on the door. However, unbeknownst to them, I had already seen them on the surveillance camera. Seeing the weapons in their hands, I was fully aware of their intentions to kill me and take over my house. At that moment, the piled up waste caught my attention, and an idea sprang to mind. I picked up the hose and approached the door, shouting, don't worry, I'll make sure everyone gets enough to eat. The three of them, thinking that I was about to open the door, excitedly raised their weapons. But the next second, a pile of feces sprayed through the small window of the door onto them. Fa Yu Ching immediately realized it was a pile of feces and started to vomit on the side, while Zhou Ping was furious. Zhang Yi, if you have the guts, come out. I'll kill you. At this, I just laughed. Don't say I didn't give you a chance. If you have the guts, come in. Hearing this, Zhou Ping, seething with rage, raised his kitchen knife and struck my front door, only to find that the door was unharmed. Instead, his hand was injured from the impact. Watching the scene, I couldn't help but laugh. My two-meter-thick security door isn't something you can break just by saying so. He couldn't fathom their motives. His home was packed with supplies, enough to rival a Walmart warehouse. The thought of them surveilling outside didn't faze him. But a sudden gunshot jolted him awake, revealing the dark side of human nature even in this post-apocalyptic world. Xinjiang Hao and his gang were looting houses amid the water shortage. Most residents ventured out to gather snow for water, leaving their homes vulnerable. Hao seized this opportunity, asserting control over the building and intimidating others in the homeowner's chat. While his tactics were ruthless, they were limited by ammunition and followers. Despite the outcry in the group chat against Hao's tyranny, few were willing to take action, preferring to plan carefully. Amidst the discussions, Zhang Yi chuckled at the irony of the loudest critics being the most hesitant to act. At this point, Uncle Yu, a retired veteran, chimed in, saying we can't keep ignoring the situation, or we'll all be doomed. He offered to lead the charge, gaining support from the homeowners. Some suggested providing weapons, while others discussed tactics to ambush Zhang Yi Hao and his group. However, Uncle Yu noted that Zhang Yi Hao had backup, and he alone wouldn't be enough to confront them. He called for a dozen young men to ensure their safety. As everyone prepared to volunteer, a woman spoke up, accusing Auntie Lin of tricking them out of supplies and questioning Uncle Yu's intentions. This sparked a debate among the homeowners, dividing them into two factions, the radical group, which wanted to unite against Zhang Yi Hao, and the conservative faction, which suspected Uncle Yu of being a spy. After two hours of arguing, the situation mirrored past conflicts, where the conservatives' indecision led to tragic consequences. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi Hao continued to exploit the chaos, backed by his armed group. Everywhere, not even sparing his own followers, anyone who dared to resist would be taken away with a single shot from Xinjiang Hao. But he knew it well in his heart, without this gun in his hand, these subordinates might not necessarily obey him. Then, he ordered his men to collect all the bodies. Watching the scene from the surveillance, Zhang Yi immediately realized that this guy was planning to use these people as backup food. It seems it's time to find an opportunity to confront this guy. The next morning, the leader of the conservative faction, Lu Tintin, sent out a cry for help in the WeChat group. Everyone, come save me. Isn't Uncle Yu a veteran? You all should be able to fight them off. As the impact on the door behind her grew more intense, Lu Tianqian grew more anxious and said, I'm in trouble. None of you will be able to escape. But as soon as her words fell, the door behind her was broken open by someone, and then she was dragged out like a dead dog. Her ordeal didn't evoke sympathy, instead, it drew mockery from the radical faction. Serves you right for being a turtle. Your retribution has come, hasn't it? On the other side, Fa Yu Ching and her girlfriends were also very nervous when they saw the scene. If they didn't come up with a plan soon, their turn would come soon. At this moment, Fa Yu Ching had a plan. She must spread the news that Zhang Yi, that guy, had hoarded a large amount of supplies and then unite everyone to take over his house. So, I was quickly added into a group chat of a mutual aid group. I saw Fong muting at me in the group chat and said, Zhang Yi, it's too dangerous for everyone to live separately now. Your door at home is particularly solid, and we lack a secure base. I hope you can join our team. 
Now, everyone must unite. If you are alone, you will be dealt with by Xinjiang how soon. Seeing the message, I couldn't help but laugh. They want to pull the rug out from under me like the previous life. So Zhang Yi replied casually, I'm fine. I'm used to living alone in this small, run-down house of 150 square meters with heating issues in Intellect City. Seeing this, the group chat exploded with concern. Old Zhang Yi, don't be short-sighted. Everyone needs to unite now, Fa Yu Ching chimed in, echoing the sentiment that saving a life is more important than building a seven-story pagoda. You can save seven people now. That would be like building a 48-story pagoda, she added. However, Zhang Yi's response was to leave the group chat, stunning Fa Yu Cheng and the others. When did this bootlicker evolve into a cool guy? They wondered. Soon, they began discussing how to capture Zhang Yi. Glass's man suggested forcefully breaking down the door, confident they could take Zhang Yi down in one fell swoop. Brown hair agreed, mentioning his expertise in locks from his previous job. They gathered at Zhang Yi's door, ready to pry it open. They even brought umbrellas to shield themselves from the cold water defense. However, despite Brown Hare's efforts to pick the lock for half a day, they couldn't even budge it. Zhang Yi, watching through surveillance, sneered inwardly, knowing his five-layer reinforced security door was as tough as a bank vault. He activated the high-voltage electric defense feature, shocking Brown Hare, who fell to the ground emitting black smoke. Fa Yu Ching, witnessing the scene, was stunned. The realization that Zhang Yi had just killed someone sank in. Glass's man, enraged, pointed at the door and shouted, Zhang Yi, you damn beast. We came to talk to you, and you just killed someone. Now Lu Tao is dead because of you. Don't you think you owe us an explanation? Zhang Yi just laughed, dismissing their intentions to pry his door open. I said shaking my head Zhang Yi loaded his crossbow, prioritizing survival. Suddenly, an arrow flew from the small window, hitting Glass's man's arm. Zhou Ping helped Glass's man up, surprised by Zhang Yi's ruthlessness. Two more arrows hit Zhou Ping and another neighbor, causing panic among Fang and the others. Returning to their lodgings, the injured men suffered an extreme cold. Without treatment, their wounds would worsen, especially since the arrows were rusty. Glass's man regretted his actions deeply. Then, Zhou Ping's cousin confronted Fa Yu Ching, blaming her for the attack. Zhou Ping defended her, but the cousin accused Fa Yu Ching of knowing about the crossbows. Feeling disappointed, Wang Min realized she had misjudged Fa Yu Ching. They decided to seek help from Dr. Zhou in the community. When Dr. Zhou Care arrived to check the wounds, she noticed similarities to a previous case she had treated for Xinjiang Hao. If it's an arrow wound, then Zhou said the wounds were too deep. Without professional equipment, the success rate of surgery was less than 20%. Furthermore, the iron arrow was rusty all over. Without antibiotics or similar drugs for treatment, they could only wait for death. Upon hearing this, one man immediately shed tears. She and Zhou Ping had grown up together, and their relationship was deep. She then turned to her niece, Dr. Zhou, pleading, you must find a way to save my cousin. Dr. Zhou turned her head and said, if we rashly pull out the arrows without medication, the consequences will only be worse. I hope you understand. At this moment, Fa Yu Ching stepped forward, saying, I remember a month ago someone delivered a batch of drugs to Zhang Yi's house. There must be plenty of antibiotics and similar drugs. Why don't we ask him for some? Hearing this, the glass-eyed man looked excited. Really? Then you go find Zhang Yi. He caused my injury, he should take responsibility. However, Wang Min on the side expressed, we were almost killed by him just now. How could he possibly give us medicine to save our lives? Hearing this, Fa Yu Ching said. We just wanted to take over his house. We didn't harm him. Besides, we're the ones who got hurt. We're the righteous ones here. Suddenly, Wang Min pointed at Fa Yu Ching and said loudly, then you'll be in charge of getting the medicine. Zhang Yi once pursued you, you're the most suitable person to handle him. Zhou Ping also chimed in, Yu Ching call him. I can only protect you when my arrow wound is healed. Hearing this, Fa Yu Ching had no choice but to agree. However, thinking of my attitude, she had no confidence. Soon, she dialed my number and said, Lu Tao and Zhou Ping are dying. Can you help? Upon hearing this, Zhang Yi laughed. So what if they die? Everyone has to die sooner or later. Besides, do you really think you can survive this snow disaster? The city is blocked by heavy snow, and this building has become an isolated island. Once the existing supplies are used up, if you don't starve to death, you will be killed by Xinjiang Hao. Upon hearing this, Fa Yu Ching trembled. Zhang Yi, I know I was wrong. It's all my fault. I let down your true feelings. But I've come to my senses now. Can you forgive me? Zhou Peng and the others were shot by you. If they don't get medicine, they will die from infection. At this point, Wang Men snatched Fa Yu Ching's phone. Zhang Yi, don't be so heartless. Keep some goodwill. You never know when you might need us in the future.
Upon hearing this, Zhang Yi laughed. Guess why I shot them with rusty arrows. I never intended to meet you again, and how do I know you won't suddenly turn against me? Upon hearing this, Wang Men hurriedly argued, How could we? We are good citizens. Zhang Yi cut her off. Good citizens wouldn't try to take over someone else's house. But well, helping you isn't impossible. Given that I have been pining after Fa Yuqing for 18 years, I might consider letting her come over alone. Upon hearing this, Fa Yuqing excitedly grabbed the phone. Zhang Yi, brother, I'm willing. From now on, Fa Yuqing is yours. Do whatever you want with her. Her best friend, Lin Kaining, also excitedly moved closer. Take me with you. Take me with you. But Fa Yu Kuangi slapped away Lin Kaining's hand. My brother Zhang Yi only wants me. You should just stay here and behave yourself. As soon as she finished speaking, one man slapped her across the face. You shameless woman. How could you betray me like this? Didn't you say you despised Zhang Yi the most and wanted to be with me? Fa Yu Ching immediately started arguing, questioning if it's wrong to pursue a better life. Zhou Ping intervened, arguing that love means wanting the other person to be happy. Despite receiving some supplies, Zhang Yi seems to have much more, leaving Fa Yu Ching defeated in the battle for her affection. Lin Kaining and Wang Min criticized Fa Yu Ching for being selfish and not considering others' well being. Meanwhile, Dr. Zhou, witnessing their argument, reminded them that their wounds were only temporarily treated and they needed to be prepared. Glassman proposed a plan to expose Zhang Yi's hoarding to the building's residents to benefit from it indirectly. Fa Yu Ching panicked, fearing she couldn't enjoy a comfortable life with Zhang Yi if they exposed him. In an attempt to win over Fa Yu Ching, intervened, promising to eventually win her heart. He confidently looked at Fa Yu Ching. Don't be afraid, I'm here, he said. This angered Wang so much that she almost wanted to slap this bootlicker to death. However, she decided to focus on the pressing matter first. She quickly posted some photos of delicious food in the homeowners group. Everyone is almost reduced to eating tree bark, but Zhang Yi is having sumptuous meals every day. Do you think that's fair? Seeing the message, Xinjiang Hao drooled all over the floor. This kid is hiding so many good things in his house. That's perfect. I can get my revenge for old grudges, he thought. Upon hearing this, the homeowners group exploded. Some people were trying to morally bind him, asking him to distribute his supplies to everyone. Some people, just for a meal, asked him to become a father to their child. There were even those who were willing to hand over billions in assets just to live in his house. Seeing the message, he just laughed. Why am I close with you? Why should I share my supplies with you? Thinking of these people breaking into his house in the past, he felt a fire in his belly. Now the tables have turned, he thought. Let's see how I'll play with you this time, he mused. Seeing his reply, Bootlicker King and others looked dumbfounded. Is Zhang Yi not afraid that we will unite against him? Others, seeing his cold-heartedness, began to blame him in the group chat. If you hadn't secretly hoarded supplies, we wouldn't be living like this. You must atone for your sins and donate the supplies to everyone. Besides, what's the point of living alone? Young people should have the spirit of contribution. Watching them bicker back and forth, Zhang Yi couldn't be bothered to engage any longer. Glancing at the falling snow outside the window, he muttered, staying at home every day is quite boring. It seems I should find some time to go out and stroll around. Luckily, he remembered he still had a few snowmobiles hidden in his pocket dimension. Once I deal with this group, it might be time to see what the outside world is like. Just then, his phone received a notification, a plea for help from Dr. Zhou. Mr. Zhang Yi, our home's medicine and supplies have been completely exhausted. Seeing the message, Zhang Yi instantly recalled Dr. Zhou from his previous life. Her death was a result of giving her last food to Salim and her daughter. However, he didn't immediately agree to her plea. Despite a good impression of her from the last life, the prettier the woman, the more dangerous, he thought. I don't want to die at the hands of a woman after barely getting another life. He wouldn't provide help without being completely sure of her trustworthiness. So, he responded, I can provide supplies, but you need to exchange something for them. Upon seeing the message, Dr. Joe immediately agreed to become his private medical assistant. If I still wouldn't agree, she could only sacrifice something else, Zhang Yi thought. But he did not agree to her terms. Instead, he said, I can provide you with medicine and food, but you have to do me a favor. Those neighbors are about to collapse soon, and they will definitely take action. I need you to be my spy to acquire their action plans. So, the decision is up to you now. You can either go along with the crowd and stay neutral, or you can choose to side with me and betray them. When Zhou Care saw the message, she fell silent. If she chose me, she'd have to face all the homeowners in the building with me. But what she didn't know was that I had fortified my house like a fortress. Even if they came with a tank, they couldn't break in. I did this just to test her. At that moment, Glass's man sent me a final ultimatum, Zhang Yi, 
I'll ask you one more time. Will you hand over the supplies or not? When I saw the message, a cold smile appeared on my face. This guy had crossed the line. I responded confidently, even if I were to feed my food to the pigs, I wouldn't share a bit with you. This angered Glass's man, and he gritted his teeth. Very well, Zhang Yi. You still dare to talk tough even when death is imminent. You brought this upon yourself. Don't say we didn't give you a chance. Soon, a chat group was set up to denounce me. Xinjiang Hao solemnly declared, Don't worry, everyone. For this operation to eliminate Zhang Yi, I only need half of the supplies. After getting the supplies, I swear I won't harm anyone. Glass's man also echoed the sentiment, saying, Let's put our past grudges aside for now. Our primary goal is to take down Zhang Yi at once. On the other side, after some consideration, Zhou Care finally agreed to my terms. She knew deep down that as a woman alone, she couldn't hold out for long without clinging to a strong figure in this apocalyptic situation. Zhang Yi received a warning from Dr. Zhou that Uncle Glasses and his gang planned a full attack at 2.30 tonight. Instead of panicking, Zhang Yi was curious about what trouble the group would stir up. When Zhou sent another message urging him to come up with a plan, Zhang Yi just laughed it off. Looking at the guns beside him, he replied, all fear comes from not having enough firepower. He assured Zhou not to worry and warned her not to join their action, stating, I'm only warning once. With that, he picked up a gun, ready to handle the situation. At 2.30 in the morning, a group of armed people approached Zhang Yi's house, determined to kill him. They surrounded the corridor at the entrance, shouting threats. Watching from the surveillance cameras, Zhang Yi couldn't help but laugh. He didn't bother being polite and activated the high-voltage device. As some of the attackers tried to break down the door, they were electrocuted, turning into charred figures emitting black smoke. Seeing this, the others were frightened and wanted to escape, but Xin Zhang Hao and his gang blocked their way. Xin Zhang Hao aimed his gun at someone's head, warning them that anyone who dared to enter the battle should be prepared to die. He doubted the high-voltage electricity could last a year, confident in their ability to break through. A man with a strategic mindset stepped forward to encourage them, saying, Don't be afraid, everyone. We must avenge our fallen comrades. As long as we work together to break this iron door, what awaits us inside are a cozy fireplace and endless food. Encouraged by the man's words, the residents, who originally wanted to leave, were instantly filled with fighting spirit. They picked up wooden stakes and continuously smashed my door, eager for a bite of food. Everyone exerted all their strength, and listening to the rhythmic thudding coming from outside, I also became interested. So, I instantly retrieved a large speaker from another space and said, seeing you all hard at work, let me play a tune for you. Hearing the battle song, the neighbors seemed to be injected with a stimulant, hitting the door even harder. However, after half an hour of relentless beating, a few of them were panting and fell to the ground. What kind of door is this? We've been hitting it for so long, but only a tiny scratch was left. It seems we won't be able to break it open without years of effort, one of them said. At this moment, the man who works at a bank stepped forward and immediately identified it as a bank vault grade door. He said, such a door can't be breached even by a tank, let alone wood. Hearing this, the others looked shocked. Then is there no way to open the steel door? One of them asked. Unless we can find the world's top locksmith, there's no chance to open it without the key, the man replied. While he was explaining, I had already come to the door with my crossbow. So professional, I murmured, and then shot an arrow. Seeing the man get shot, the other residents in the hallway panicked. Shani actually has weapons? Glass's man and Xinjiang Hao didn't even tell us, one of them said. Some of the slower neighbors were quickly turned into thieves by my arrows. Looking at the neighbors scattered around on the floor, I felt no guilt. If they want my life, there's no need for me to be polite. Just then, the man with glasses had an idea. Everyone, don't panic. I have a plan. Zhang Yi's steel door might be thick, but the wall is still made of cement bricks. I don't believe we can't break it down. Hearing this, the neighbors seem to understand. We have so many people, we can definitely break his wall in less than half an hour. A few neighbors immediately mustered up their strength and started smashing the wall with vigor, while the man with glasses kept encouraging them. Sure enough, in a short while, cracks started appearing in the wall. Seeing this, a big man smashed the wall with even more force, but the next second, a metallic clang echoed, and the impact numbed the man's arm. The man with glasses rushed forward and exclaimed, Damn it! The wall is made of steel plates too. Hearing this, several big men looked shocked. Who uses steel plates for wall construction? But they still didn't give up. They randomly hit different parts of the wall, hoping to find a weakness. Watching the scene, Zhang Yi couldn't help but laugh. I'm sorry to inform you that the outer walls of my house are reinforced with half a meter thick, high quality steel. Not to mention your hammers, even if a cannonball came, I wouldn't be afraid. Soon, 
the neighbors realize that Zhang Yi must have known about the apocalypse in advance, which is why he built such a sturdy fortress. The man with glasses grew angrier the more he thought about it. He knew about the snow disaster all along, this selfish and narrow-minded person only caring about himself, ignoring the lives of everyone else. Some people couldn't bear this despair and started to cry on the spot. At that moment, Xin Zhang Hao emerged from the crowd, questioning why everyone was crying. He doubted if Zhang Yi's house was as impenetrable as they thought. Energized by his words, the neighbors decided to split up and attack the house. They hammered away vigorously, but soon realized Zhang Yi's house was built like a fortress. Watching from the surveillance, Zhang Yi chuckled at their efforts. After hammering for a while, the neighbors fell into despair again. Zhang Yi had indeed built his house like a reinforced tortoise shell. Without power tools, breaking through would be nearly impossible. As hunger gnawed at them, one neighbor's stomach grumbled loudly, craving meat. Suddenly, an idea struck him. He glanced at his neighbor, and they both drooled at the thought of meat. Meanwhile, Glass's man despaired at the idea of waiting for death in this apocalypse. Remembering Zhang Yi's balcony renovations, Glass's man suggested breaking in through the floor to ceiling windows. Upon hearing this, everyone's hopes were reignited. They refused to believe that Zhang Yi would seal his windows shut. They gathered together and began moving toward Zhang Yi's balcony, using planks to reach him. Outside his window, they yelled threats and demands for Zhang Yi to open the door. Unfazed, Zhang Yi calmly sipped his coffee and enjoyed his meal. As they continued to knock on the windows, Zhang Yi remained composed. He decided to teach them a lesson. He casually walked to the kitchen and crafted a homemade special cocktail. With a smirk, he placed it strategically in a small window in the room. In an instant, flames erupted on the balcony as the cocktail exploded. One of the neighbors, caught in the flames, wailed in agony before leaping off the balcony to escape the fire. Witnessing the chaos, the other neighbors pressed against the glass, begging for mercy. But Zhang Yi was unforgiving, reminding them of their past actions. Left with no choice, they retreated, hoping for help from those behind them. However, their escape was blocked by Glass Man and his group, who refused to let them bring the fire inside. In a desperate attempt to escape, one of the men swung a wooden hammer, only to lose his balance and fall from the building. Soon, those with no way out were charred in the fire. Facing this, Glass Man and his group showed no mercy. Instead, they gathered around the fire to warm themselves. The neighbors, no longer arrogant, dropped their weapons and approached Zhang Yi's floor to ceiling windows. Sorry, we were wrong. We just want a bite to eat. Please save us. We'll do whatever you want from now on, they pleaded. Listening to the police from outside the window, Zhang Yi sighed. Don't be like this. It makes me feel bad. When I'm upset, I have a strange quirk, I want to eat, he confessed, then started eating noodles from his bowl. The sight made the people outside drool. If only we could have some soup, they lamented. I know that in this apocalypse, human hearts are unpredictable, but now I have a better strategy, Zhang Yi declared. I'm not a cold-hearted person who wouldn't save people. I'll give you a chance. Bring me Xinjiang Hao, and I'll feed you these noodles for a week, enough for each meal. Hearing this, they all looked excitedly at Xinjiang Hao in the next building. To them, he looked like a delicious roast chicken. Taking him down would mean they wouldn't have to worry about food and drink for a week. Seeing their ill-intent gazes, Xinjiang Hao felt a chill down his spine. There are always villains trying to harm me, he thought. Before he could think further, they charged towards him. However, under the threat of Xinjiang Hao's gun, they dared not act rashly. At this moment, Xinjiang Hao received a bounty notice sent in by the homeowner group. One offered food to whoever could kill Xinjiang Hao. When Xinjiang Hao saw the message, he understood why people were hostile towards him. The next day, neighbors set up an ambush for him. Though Xinjiang Hao had a pistol, his bullets were limited. Plus, my safe house was impenetrable. Previous attempts to attack me resulted in many casualties. It was clear they had to take advantage of his vulnerable state. Xinjiang Hao scolded his subordinates to go find snow to eat, knowing he was a target. Suddenly, two neighbors attacked with kitchen knives. Despite his quick response, he was wounded on his back. His men dragged the attacker's bodies home, but more trouble came when another attacker wounded him. After Xinjiang Hao asked a subordinate to assist him back to his room, he made a call to invite Dr. Zhou to treat his wound. Shortly after, Dr. Zhou arrived at Xinjiang's house carrying a medicine box. Dr. Zhou made it clear that he wouldn't offer free help, but Xinjiang smiled and offered to share some food in exchange for treatment. However, seeing the food, Dr. Zhou felt nauseated and refused to eat it, preferring death. Xinjiang, realizing the importance of having a doctor, tried to reassure her and even reached out to touch her cheek, promising to save her for last. Dr. Zhou, feeling uncomfortable, quickly left but was stopped by Xinjiang's subordinates. They insisted she stay until Xinjiang's wound healed. Meanwhile, 
Xinjiang and his men discussed plans to deal with a threat posed by someone who had issued a bounty on Xinjiang. They decided to move next door and keep watch, waiting for the opportune moment to confront the threat. Dr. Zhou, overhearing their conversation, quickly excused herself to the bathroom. In reality, she was relaying their conversation to Zhang Yi. Zhang Yi instructed her to stay and keep watching. Shortly after, there was a knock on the door of the neighboring house, and Xinjiang Hao and his men confidently entered. The couple living there dared not protest. Thankfully, they had hidden the remaining food on their person. With many empty rooms available, any could serve as suitable living quarters. Suddenly, two of Xinjiang Hao's men struck the couple from behind, causing them to collapse in a pool of blood. Xinjiang Hao, wearing a cruel smile, justified his actions by claiming it was for their own good. He argued that in the cold weather, they would freeze to death outside, and they needed to store some food. Meanwhile, in Wang Min's house, the three men with glasses lay on the sofa, crying out in pain. Since their failed attempt to forcibly take medicine from Zhang Yi's house, their wounds had worsened without proper treatment. A foul stench filled the hall as their wounds began to fester. Seeing this, Glass Man was shocked. Having just graduated and looking for a job, he didn't want to die so soon. Zhou Ping and the others had similar wounds. If it were just a scratch, it would be fine, but alas, they were wounded by my rusty arrows. Without antibiotics, their wounds would only worsen. At this moment, Zhou Ping ran to Wang. Can you please plead with Zhang Yi for us again? Otherwise, we're all going to die, he begged. But Wang waved his hand. I'm out of ideas. Zhang Yi is not easily persuaded. On the other side, after the bounty was put on Xing Zhang Hao, he began to feel restless. He even feared being ambushed by his subordinates in the middle of the night. So, he used food as a bribe to recruit residents to join his camp. Seeing this from the surveillance, I couldn't help but laugh. Even if you have many people in your camp, Xing Zhang Hao, what do you think they will do when there's no food left? Then, I picked up the phone to call Dr. Zhou, asking her about the situation on her side. I could only hear her nervously answering. Xinjiang Hao's group has gone crazy. The existing food has been eaten up, and they are preparing to start robbing houses. Many neighbors have already become their victims. She pleaded, can you save me? I haven't eaten anything for two days. I can't hold on much longer if this continues. Upon hearing this, I paused for a moment. Dr. Zhou is the main surgeon at the nearby grade 3A hospital. In the post-apocalyptic world, doctors are hard to find. We can't let her die so easily. So, I replied, don't worry. Once I finish this last task, I assure you will not want for anything. Just then, my front door was knocked. It was Zhou Ping at the door, hysterical. Zhang Yi, you coward. Come out. Fa Yuching is starving to death, and you're still hiding in here. Are you a man? Hearing this, I couldn't help but laugh. At this point, I'm willing to call you the last bootlicker in the apocalypse, I said flatly. You're still thinking about Fa Yuching at a time like this? You should think more about yourself. Given your current situation, the tetanus bacteria has spread all over your body. Even if I gave you antibiotics, it would be useless. I remember you've been a bootlicker for so many years. I don't think you've ever even held Fa Yuching's hand, have you? Instead of waiting here to die, you might as well do what you want to do. Hearing this, Zhou Ping suddenly realized. He struggled to get up, staggering back up the stairs. After returning home, he rushed into Fa Yuching's room, kneeling down before her with a thud. Seeing Zhou Ping, an ecstatic Fa Yuching was instantly scared into screaming. Zhou Ping, what are you doing? Zhou Ping, his eyes bloodshot, stared at her intently. Fa Yuching, will you marry me? Fa Yuching frowned, disgust filling her eyes. She instinctively pinched her nose and shoved Zhou Ping to one side bitterly, saying, Get out of here, you're about to die, you stink. I have to go find Zhang Yi. Who do you think you are? You're not even a spare tire in my book. Zhou Ping broke down. He had given so much for Fa Yuching, even his own life was at stake, but Fa Yuching never had a heartbeat for him from beginning to end. In desperation, Zhou Ping grabbed Fa Yuching's neck tightly, shrieking hysterically, You love me. I'm on the brink of death. Let's face it together, Fa Yuching fearfully pushed Zhou Ping away. Your smell is awful. Isn't it because of you that I'm in this situation? Zhou Ping retorted, her face turning purple from Fa Yuching's grip. Who's to blame if you're useless? Meanwhile, after a night of deep thought, Dr. Zhou finally agreed to my proposition. She knew it was a test, and although dangerous, she had to do it to survive under Xinjiang Hao's control. With this in mind, Zhou slowly walked towards the kitchen. She told Xinjiang Hao that she wanted to help in the kitchen. Hearing this, he thought she had come to her senses and nodded in approval. That's for the best. I knew you couldn't resist. You still have some use for me. Dr. Zhou turned back, returning to her usual aloof demeanor. I don't want to die. I want to live, 
she said slowly. Xinjiang Hao finally relaxed, waving his hand nonchalantly and allowing Dr. Zhou into the kitchen to help. Once inside, Dr. Zhou picked up an axe and started chopping wood for the fire. Energy is scarce these days, and cooking can only be done by burning furniture. Although she had agreed to my terms, she couldn't help but feel hesitant about this kind of meat. After a while, a younger brother asked Zhou to watch the fire and not let it go out. Then, he turned and left to prepare the ingredients. Seeing this, Zhou knew her chance had come. She pulled out a small bottle from her pocket and poured all the liquid inside into the pot. Fighting the nausea in her stomach, she carefully stirred the pot. At mealtime, she served everyone a large bowl. Looking at the steaming meat, I smiled. I never expected Dr. Joe to join us. To gain their trust, she served herself a bowl of soup and quietly returned to her room. Little did they know, Dr. Joe had drugged the soup. Back in her room, she waited silently for the drug to take effect. She had added most of a bottle of sleeping pills to the pot. These pills work quickly, just one can put someone into a deep sleep in 30 minutes. Now, all she had to do was wait and hope Xinjiang Hao wouldn't notice she had tampered with the soup. In no time, Xinjiang Hao and the others fell asleep on the sofa. Seeing this, Dr. Zhou knew the drug had taken effect. She took a deep breath and immediately messaged me, Zhang Yi. I've given them a large dose of sleeping pills. They've all passed out. What are you planning to do next? I replied flatly, drag them to the balcony. Seeing that Xinjiang Hao and his group were all here, I let out a cold sneer. You guys finally fell into my hands, huh? Dr. Joe saw me smirking on the other side and nervously asked, do you plan to kill them all? Hearing this, I smiled and directly tossed a hemp rope over. You guessed wrong. The one to take action is you, not me. Now, find the gun on Xinjiang Hao and throw it to me. Then tie them all to this railing. Upon hearing this, Dr. Joe hesitated. If she truly intended to harm, I wasn't sure if she could follow through. Before she could dwell on it further, I aimed the handgun directly at her. You've got one chance. Miss it, and there won't be another, I warned. Seeing that I was serious, Dr. Zhou had no option but to comply with my instructions and tie up Xinjiang Hao and his group. Upon searching Xinjiang Hao, Dr. Zhou found the flashy handgun. I then pointed it directly at Zhou's head, removed the magazine, and tossed it aside. Dr. Zhou hesitated, questioning if she could trust me not to turn on her. I chuckled, do you have any better options now? In this harsh weather, you won't survive long without my assistance. Reluctantly, Dr. Joe followed my orders, removing the magazine and handing over the handgun. After inspecting it to ensure it was the same one Xinjiang Hao had, I returned to the room. There, I grabbed a water pipe and sprayed it directly at Xinjiang Hao's group, shocking Dr. Joe with the ruthless method of freezing them. Soundly sleeping, Xinjiang Hao was abruptly awakened by the freezing cold water, his hands and feet bound. Realizing he had been drugged, he looked at me, accusing me of being despicable. I couldn't help but laugh at his audacity. Opening the valve again, I directed a stream of water at them. No one could withstand such extreme cold for long, and soon Xinjiang Hao and his group were frozen solid. Just then, Dr. Zhou received my call, congratulating her for passing the test. Collapsing to the ground in relief, she had proven her worth under my guidance. Keeping my promise, I allowed her to stay in my house. When she cautiously arrived at my door, I held a handgun, ready to defend myself. After letting her in, I locked the door behind her. Overwhelmed with relief, she collapsed on the floor, feeling a sense of warmth she hadn't felt in a long time. Dr. Joe was surprised at how well I was living. Just as she started to relax in this cozy paradise, I surprised her by putting a gun to her back. Don't get too comfortable yet, I said. Just because you're on my side now doesn't mean you're off the hook. You still need to prove you're not a threat. She understood what I meant and quickly removed her coat to show she wasn't hiding anything dangerous. Satisfied, I handed her a towel. You've been working hard. Take a hot shower, I told her. She grumbled inwardly, thinking how unfair it was that my life seemed better than before the apocalypse. As she showered, I sorted through the medical kit she brought, stashing away anything that could be dangerous. Even though we were being honest with each other, it never hurt to be cautious. Two hours later, Dr. Joe emerged from the bathroom in pajamas, her hair still wet there was a hint of beauty in her disheveled appearance. I gestured for her to sit next to me on the sofa. I grabbed the hairdryer and started drying her hair. I didn't let you stay here because you're pretty, but because you're useful to me. But remember, this is my place. Letting you stay here is a big favor, so don't try anything sneaky. There are cameras everywhere. If I catch you plotting against me, I won't hesitate to get rid of you, I warned her. Then, I pointed to the room next door. You'll stay there from now on without my permission you're not allowed to wander around. Dr. Joe responded softly, clearly understanding the consequences of crossing me. Dr. Joe, 
you're smart. I hope you'll keep your word. Of course, I'll treat you fairly, I assured her. Then, I walked behind Dr. Joe, about to reveal my biggest secret to her. I needed to ensure her loyalty to me. Everyone knows the snow disaster was caused by gamma rays from a supernova explosion. But these rays can also mutate humans, I explained. With a wave of my hand, I conjured a loaf of bread out of thin air. This is the superpower I gained from another dimension. I can store any supplies in it. Seeing this, Dr. Joe suddenly understood why I live so comfortably. No wonder I have so many supplies, she realized. Dr. Joe, you're smart. If you stick with me, you'll enjoy all my supplies, including food and hot baths. If I die, the supplies in the different space will disappear with me, so you can only survive if I survive. Right now, I don't fully trust you. You need to exchange labor for rewards, so from now on, you'll be responsible for all the housework. Just as Dr. Joe was about to agree, I interrupted her. Besides this, what else can you offer me? Upon hearing this, Dr. Joe's cheeks suddenly turned red. Being a smart person, she naturally knew what I was talking about. The next day, I looked at the still sleeping joke with mixed feelings. Having a woman around in the apocalypse is quite nice. If I were alone, I fear I might have a mental breakdown one day. Then I knocked on the door, signaling Joe to get up for breakfast. Dr. Joe woke up from her sleep, this was the best sleep she'd had since the apocalypse began. She then dressed and came into the living room. Afterwards, I smiled. Were you waiting for me? Hurry up and eat. Hearing this, Dr. Joe didn't hesitate, she picked up the hamburger on the table and started eating it hungrily. Seeing my half-smiling expression, Dr. Joe realized her eating manners were not good, so she sat up straight like a well-behaved child. After Dr. Joe was full, I tossed her a thermal coat. This coat is a high-tech product from before the apocalypse, it can withstand temperatures down to minus 100 degrees. Then I gestured for Joe to come out with me. Dr. Joe was puzzled. What are we going to do? At this, I gave a cold laugh. Obviously, we're going out to smash those icicles to pieces. If they're frozen into icicles, they're still disgusting to look at. Although these people were indirectly killed by her, she still hesitated to smash them. Before she could think too much, I made a gesture of invitation. Dr. Joe, it's your turn to take the stage, I said. Seeing this, Joe couldn't say anything else. She immediately climbed over the balcony and went to the other side along the board. Then, she raised the baseball bat in her hand and smashed it down on the people frozen into icicles. Watching this, I took out my phone and started recording. Are you recording? Dr. Joe asked puzzled. I want to show those dishonest guys who's in charge of this building now, I replied. At this, Dr. Joe didn't hesitate and continued to swing the baseball bat in her hand. At this moment, she didn't care about her angelic image. As long as she could survive, that's all that mattered. However, what she didn't expect was right after I posted the video in the owner's group, not only did the neighbors not blame her, they applauded her. Some even wept for joy at the sight. After all, Chin Chang Hao had been domineering here for a long time, and there were no few owners who had died at his hands. Now, seeing Xinjiang get his comeuppance, they were naturally overjoyed. So they started flattering me in the group. Fa Yu Ching was the first to call me, which surprised me. I didn't expect her to still be around. Pitifully, she said on the phone, Zhang Yi, Xinjiang Hao is dead. Can I come to your house for food and warmth? I don't want you to be with that woman. You belong only to me. I just laughed at her request. So you're not dead after all, I remarked. Fa Yu Ching seemed to understand. I get it now, Zhang Yi. He thought I was dead, and that's why he's with that woman, Dr. Zhou. I'm coming to live the good life with you now. But her best friend and Wang were not happy about this. Their miserable lives were all because of Fa Yu Ching, so they naturally wouldn't allow her to have a good life. Soon, the sound of the three women fighting with each other came from the other end of the phone. Seeing this, Joe Care hurried over. She felt a sense of crisis at this moment, afraid that I would run away. This scene suddenly gave me a wicked idea. Fa Yu Ching, in the last life, you made me turn into despair. This time, it's your turn to experience despair. With this, the chapter concludes. Don't miss out on the next installment. Hit that subscribe button.